uh, what I would like to do in the next 18 months is to tell you a few uh, facts and uh, a couple of stories. I may give you also, tell you also few, uh, some jokes, if I, if, if I may. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I hope that uh, we'll be able to convince you that we do need a, a new generation of doctors, and, uh, and in fact, probably we need, to, we need, it, uh, we need a, also a new generation of, uh, of patients. Um, now, over the years, the uh, role of the doctor has actually changed uh, dramatically. Um, and even more, how patients actually perceive the doctor has actually changed. Um, many years ago, and probably there are still doctors that believe they are gods or emperor. Uh, they know everything, they're infallible. Um, and perhaps some patients actually still believe that their doctors are really like God. Um, unfortunately, there are some patients actually don't feel, don't feel that really doctors know everything. And in fact, over the years, uh, some patients actually have actually lost trust in their doctor. And uh, so when, uh, uh, when, you, when, you see, when you go and see a doctor, you know, a family doctor or a doctor in the hospital, what do you expect from him or from her? Now, I'm a doctor. Uh, I've been a doctor for about uh, more than 30 years. Uh, I'm originally from Italy, but I've actually worked in Italy, in the uh, United Kingdom. And now I'm in Astana. So in Astana, I'm doing uh, a very interesting project because my, my job here is to develop a new medical school, so to, uh, basically to train a new generation of doctors um, who are be able to, obviously, to practice modern medicine. So when I, uh, when I practice as a doctor, I always try to remember this, this type of question. You, know, you as a patient, what do you want from... Uh, from your doctor. Uh, so this is the first story I want to tell you. Um, it actually happened to me, um, and, and this is my experience as a patient ra rather than a doctor. Um, it was about a couple of years ago. I was in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, where I used to live. And uh, in the morning, I woke up, and uh, I felt a little bit strange, a little bit dizzy. Uh, I was sweating. And I noticed that my heart was beating very, very fast. So I asked my, my, my daughter to basically take me to the hospital. Uh, I went to the hospital, I was seen by a nurse initially, and then by uh, a doctor. And what I remember very well from that experience, there were three important things in my mind. One, I want, to, I want to know what was wrong with me. I want to know whether that was a serious I issue for me. Uh, and obviously, I want to be treated. You know, I want to have some medicine and, uh, and to be cured. Um, and what I remember from my experience, that the doctor really explained everything to me very clearly. Um, he said he was going to do some blood test. Yeah. Um, then he was going to do some investigation. And then he, prevent, he basically pre uh, presented to me some option. You know, probably we, what, we can give you some medicine and then wait. Or perhaps we can do something a little bit uh, uh, more difficult. You know, um, you know there, there may be some problems, but we may be able to cure you. Um, which was actually was quite uh, interesting. Uh, thing they were going to do. They were going to basically uh, put some uh, electric uh, current through my, through my heart, because my heart was beating very, very fast. At the end of the day, I decided to, the, to go ahead with this, um, you know, a little bit strange uh, option. Uh, but then, after half an hour, I felt perfectly well. And, uh, and then, uh, two or three hours later, I, was, uh, I went home. Uh, so my experience as a patient was absolutely uh, amazing, fantastic. Uh, because I walk into the hospital, I walk out completely cured, and I knew exactly what was happening to me. So this is really what is, should be more than medicine now. And uh, whether you live in, in Astana, whether you live in Atirao, or whether you live in London, uh, this is what doctors should be practiced. Should practice patient-centered care, which means the patient is at the center of the healthcare system. So the doctor and the nurse should treat the individual patient rather than just treating the disease. In my case, they were treating me as an individual, not just my heart, which was, uh, was, uh, was a little bit funny. Uh, and this is really what uh, should be done uh, wherever, wherever you go, which is a little bit different from what, what we call, what we used to call doctor-patient care. Um, though where the doctor is deciding whether he's a doctor like a god or emperor, uh, I don't mind, but I think it's, uh, it's a really completely different approach. In some cases, the outcome maybe, maybe is very similar, but certainly the patient, the patient's experience will be completely different. 
So this is a map. I want to tell you a little bit some facts, um, not many, um, but this is what is called the life expectancy at birth, and this is the world with different colors. Now, if you just fo uh, focus on the colors and the country, so this is a way to um, predict how, how long somebody is going to live based on where they were born. So if you were born in a green country, uh, like Europe, uh, like North America, you're going to live longer than if you were born in a red country, uh, like in Africa. Uh, and the difference, can you see, could be quite dramatic, 20, 30 years difference. Um, fortunately, um, in Kazakhstan, we are an orange country, so we, we are in between. And I have to say, this, the situation in Kazakhstan is certainly improving, uh, or has been improving over the years. But still, it's not perfect. It's not what we really expect uh, in, uh, in 2015. Because if you are born in, uh, in Kazakhstan, if you're a man, uh, you are going to probably live until you're 67, 68. If you're a woman, uh, until you're 74, 75. So much lower than some of the other countries in the, in the West, like in Europe or in, uh, in America. Um, certainly better, obviously, than, than in Africa. So why we see these big differences in uh, what we call life expectancy at birth? Uh, obviously, uh, there are a number of different reasons. Um, certainly in, in places like Africa, sometimes they, they, they lack really the basic, you know. What we, you know, water is absolutely essential. Clean water gives you hygiene, will, prevent, uh, will actually provide the prevention against diseases, infection. Um, but you also need food, and you need safe food, and you need uh, in, in good quantity and variety. Um, you need jobs, because need, uh, people, if, if they've got jobs, they can actually uh, then make some uh, healthy decision about their own uh, decision, uh, uh, informed decision about their own health. Uh, you need infrastructure, you need obviously hospital, clinics, you, got, you need enough doctors and enough uh, nurses. And, uh, but there are also another issue that we see you know, in Kazakhstan, but also we see in some countries like in the US, like in, uh, in, uh, in some of the European countries, where the life expectancy is relatively good. And we, treat, we see patients when it's too late. You know, if you go to a hospital in, uh, in Astana, you will see that there are lots of patients with uh, chronic disease. What I mean by chronic disease? Uh, diseases like cardiovascular disease, heart problems, respiratory, uh, respiratory problems, cancer. So it's too late, because it, I think what, what, we, what we see now is disease which is, has gone so far that even with this fantastic treatment that we have, we won't be able to cure the actual individual, but we can, we can only cure the symptoms. Um, so this is why we need a completely different new approach to, to medicine, and this is why we need the new, the new generation of doctors. This is a quote from, you know, 100 years ago, but it's actually so interesting because it's actually predicting what we really need, should, should be doing in terms of practicing modern, modern medicine. We should really prevent, and in fact in America they say we, we should preempt the disease. And I just want to give you a couple of examples. You can, we can certainly prevent cancer. Cancer is a pretty horrible disease, uh, but in fact we can prevent it and we can cure in some cases. And this is some, some really well-known risk factor for different types of cancers and other diseases, in fact. Um, alcohol. Alcohol, obviously, lots of people drink alcohol. I like drinking alcohol sometimes, wine and whiskey and vodka as well. Um, but in fact, if you drink too much, you're going to have a problem. Like many, 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 in many situations in life, you know, everything in moderation is okay. But if you drink too much, you're going to have liver problems you're going to have uh, if, if, uh, something which is called cirrhosis, and you may also have cancer, liver cancer. And in Kazakhstan, uh, about 30% to 40% of the population drink, and about 15% drink too much. So we can really moderate our alcohol intake, and we can prevent actually a number of different diseases, not only for the liver, but also for, for, from other organs like the esophagus. Uh, red meat. I mean, I love red meat in Kazakhstan. Much, much, much tasty, much better than the red meat that I used to eat in the United Kingdom. Uh, but unfortunately, red meat has been associated with uh, uh, a number of problems, particularly uh, tumor of the intestine. 
Um, and in fact, you know, you should moderate the amount of uh, red meat, but also increase also the amount of fruit and vegetables that, uh, that, that you eat. Um, another important issue in cancer prevention is actually infection. There are some really interesting statistics because about 25% of all the cancer deaths in developing countries are related to infection. And so if you prevent the infection, you can prevent cancer. That's very easy. And in fact, there is, even in developed countries, uh, we know that uh, cancer of the cervix, for example, is related to an infection, human papillomavirus. And this is why we've actually there are a number of vaccination programs in uh, uh, certainly Western countries, in many, many countries, to prevent the infection from uh, human papillomavirus. And in this way, we can prevent uh, cancer of the cervix. Uh, smoking, um, I don't need to remind you that smoking is bad. And in fact, it's the most avoidable risk factor for cancer mortality. Uh, despite that, people still smoke. Um, but this, uh, this, actually, this slide actually shows a very interesting study uh, which was done 20 years ago in the uh, United Kingdom when they surveyed uh, a number of doctors, British doctors, and they asked them about their tobacco uh, habit. Um, I won't go into detail, but what, uh, what this, actually, this study shows very, very clearly that if you never smoke, you live longer than if you smoke you actually smoke 15 cigarettes a day or 20 cigarettes a day, and you in increase your length of living by 10, 15 years. You know, 10, 15 years. So instead of dying at 50, you can die at 65. Um, and the problem with tobacco is that tobacco is actually causing not only lung problems, like everybody knows, but it can actually cause also uh, uh, cancer of the kidney, uh, cancer of the, of the um, bladder, uh, cancer of the mouth, uh, and in, in addition to that, it's actually causing a lot of problems also in terms of your cardiovascular system, in terms of heart, heart problem. Uh, despite that, in Kazakhstan, 50% of men smoke, women uh, at least 20%, and some statistics even more than that. Um, but, you know, that, that, these data are in the literature, and if we can reflect on that, perhaps we can really make a, a big impact in terms of preempting, you know, preempting, preventing a disease like, uh, like cancer. So this is a very famous actress, so this is another story I want to tell you, uh, Angelina Jolie. I'm, I'm sure you've seen some other films. Very attractive lady, very beautiful, very successful. But today, the story about Angelina Jolie is not related to being a, an actress, but to be a, a, a woman, a patient. And uh, in her family, uh, her mother died of breast cancer when she was in the mid-50s. Uh, and her aunt also died of breast cancer when she was relatively young. Um, so if you have uh, you know, two people in your family, three people, dying for cancer, which is normally occurs later on in life, so an early, an early onset. Um, perhaps you need to think about, certainly for breast cancer, whether there is some genetic predisposition in the family. Uh, obviously, she's a very well-educated lady, um, very wealthy, so she went to a very good doctor in the US, and she decided to do a simple blood test to see whether her genes were okay. And, uh, and unfortunately, they did a test, and they found that one gene, which is called BRCA1, was faulty. So it wasn't functioning normally. And because that gene was faulty, immediately a probability to develop breast cancer went to up to 85%. Uh, and because this gene is also involved in other cancer, um, even the, ovarian, the probability to develop ovarian cancer went up to 50%. Uh, so, obviously, everything was presented, the doctor presented all the information, um, you know, what to do, um, and the, obviously the, the, you know, the problem if she didn't do anything about uh, uh, health, and then she decided, she made an important decision, because she decided to have uh, uh, something which is a very, uh, you know, a very dramatic operation for a woman, which is basically the removal of breast tissue, in an individual who actually was perfectly normal. She didn't have breast cancer, she didn't have any sign or symptom of breast cancer, but she did what is called the bi bilateral mastectomy. Um, but immediately after the operation, the probability to develop breast cancer went down again from 85 
to 5%. So this is a, a good example of what we call now, uh, exactly what we call and we practice, as personalized medicine or uh, precision medicine, which actually tells you how imprecise medicine is at the moment. Uh, where basically, again, you're treated the individual, you decide about the specific treatment that that individual requires, um, and with a specific dose and, uh, and, and time, uh, you know, uh, because you're treating the individual rather than the disease. Angelina Jolie is also a very good example of how patients are engaged in their own health care, in their own treatment. So, uh, Today, I basically gave you some examples of, uh, you know, how modern medicine is now, is now practiced. There are a number of ingredients that you need. You know, obviously, you need, uh, um, you know, you need a, a good healthcare system. You know, you need hospital, you need uh, uh, doctors, you need nurses, you need education, you need jobs and everything else. Um, but the future, really is about, I hope that when you, next time you go to a doctor, first of all, you know what to expect from him or from her. And then eventually, I hope you'll find the new, the new generation of doctors who are actually going to engage. They may not be God or emperor, I hope, but certainly there will be uh, people who actually will listen to you, listen to your worries, your concern. They will be skilled. Obviously, you need competent doctors. Um, you need uh, a doctor who are decisive because they need to take important decisions, but they, don't, they should not be arrogant uh, because we can all make mistakes. And, and they will involve you in the decision, I mean, in decision making of your own uh, healthcare treatment. And I'm sure that what you need, what we all need in order to achieve that, we need a, a new generation of doctors and a new generation of patients. Thank you.